there friends, my name is Rachel GNS Middle. Gilbert and Sullivan is my middle name and my middle name is my last name and I am here today on behalf of Forbear Theatre to explore the magic of the Gilbert and Sullivan operas by very pedantically ranking every element of them. Now today I am going by a suggestion from my friend David Thompson. Now David Thompson is my first and my second Strephon in two of the three times that I play Phyllis. So David has a very special GNS related relationship with me and I, I like him a lot. And this was his suggestion. I, I had to do it pretty much immediately because I was like, that's a great suggestion. It is the sickest burns <laughs> in GNS. What really does constitute a sick burn? Obviously it's some kind of insult but I feel like there has to be a degree of savagery behind it and also a degree of clever wordplay. And I feel like it can't just be related to some ethereal concept, it needs to be directed at the person it's aimed at. There are maybe a couple of slight exceptions that I have included on this list for their iconic value, but what we're looking for when it comes to a really sick burn is the intentional clever use of wordplay. So there may be some things in GNS that are taken as insults, like the example that comes to mind is, oh, there I was certain of it, directly I heard you play. That could be taken as a burn, but because it's not intended as such, I didn't really feel like I could include it. Before we get started, this is a reminder to subscribe to the channel below. You can also donate to Forbear Theatre. Help us raise the money to get a really cracking set for HMS Pinafore at Hever Castle. We've already gone a lot of the way. We've got these amazing backdrop frames and we've certainly been able to afford a lot of costumes for the Grand Duke. And we've also just been able to secure rehearsal venues for both HMS Pinafore and the Grand Duke. The one thing I do still need to spend money on this year is for embellishments of the sets for HMS Pinafore and the Grand Duke. So everything you send will just elevate our productions just that little bit more and will mean that when people view us, they don't just see a lot of talented people doing a lot of awesome things. They see a lot of talented people doing awesome things with a good set and costumes, which I think is something we'd be missing, apart from obviously when we've hired the costumes and hired the sets from the festival. That doesn't really count because that's not ours. That level of aesthetic professionalism, I think is what Forbear has been missing and what maybe stops people from putting us on the level of some of these other companies out there. So help us get aesthetically transfigured. Thank you. Sarah Nash, thank you Alistair McTurk, thank you Olivia McLeod, thank you Clay Hilly. That donation was an absolute lifesaver. It meant we weren't going to be naked in the Grand Duke, so thanks for that. Maybe some people would, would have preferred he hadn't made that donation, then we would have been naked, but you have him to thank for that. So with that in mind, let's get started with the 20 sickest burns in the Gilbert and Sullivan operas. Number 20 from The Pirates of Penzance. Individually, I love you all with a passion unspeakable, but collectively, I look upon you with a disgust that amounts to absolute detestation. Now, maybe the first five on this list are ones that maybe slightly didn't meet all the requirements for a really savage burn, and I think that this one is slightly lacking in the sense that I don't think he really means anything bad by it, but that kind of almost makes it more savage, so I did include this one. Ooh, Frederick. <laughs> Number 19 is from Utopia Limited. It's the only really comic paper in Utopia. I wouldn't be without it for the world. If it had any literary merit, I could understand it. Oh, it has literary merit. My dear father, it's mere ungrammatical twaddle. And again, this is one that maybe doesn't quite fit every facet of a sick burn because she didn't realise that it was him that was writing it. But I just included it because of the level of ouch that King Paramount must have felt upon her saying, they're like, oh, wow. <laughs> That's really harsh for something that he'd worked really hard on. Number 18 is from Trial by Jury. 
she may very well pass for 43 in the dusk with the light behind her. And again, this one has gone quite low on the list because the person who he is referring to isn't actually in front of us, so I don't think we can really get the full whack of that burn, but it is just so iconic, I feel like I had to include it. I don't really think I agree with the burn. Would you believe it? I am only six years away from 43, and I am in no doubt whatsoever that I'm gonna look just as fabulous when I'm 43, so I don't really think that... You can really make those jokes anymore because I think that a lot of people are looking a lot younger these days and also who even cares about age and beauty standards, but it's iconic. I wanted to include it for its iconicness and so that is what I have done. Number 17 is from The Gondoliers. In the meantime, may I suggest the absolute propriety of your regarding yourselves as single young ladies? Goodbye. Now, <laughs> again, this kind of plays a bit on that sexist trope that women are going to be really unhappy being single, but <laughs> there's something about just the smugness <laughs> that oozes from that line. It's like, oh, wow. <laughs> he, he does not pull any punches. Number 16 is from Radigal. Are you considered a good likeness? Because as a work of art, you are poor. <laughs> That's so rude. <laughs> like, dude, he's he's a scary ghost that can torture you. <laughs> that is probably going to kill you. You don't really want to be making enemies with him. As a work of art, you are poor. Ooh, Robin. Oh, that's like because he is a work of art. Like that's what he is. As a work of art, you are poor. It's just so blunt. It really is quite savage. It's savager than I think people give it credit for. Oh, ouch. Number 15 is from Princess Ida. And for the self-same cause, like precious stones, his sensible remarks derive their value from their scarcity. What a great line. It is truly savage, but also really clever and very dignified as well. Good work, Gamma. Number 14 is from Thespis. Don't know ya, don't know ya, don't know ya. Which is in response to Jupiter <laughs> appearing as a god. So again, this relies on a certain amount of context, but just the idea of a literal god appearing before this massive narcissist, don't know ya. <laughs> And after Jupiter is already feeling a bit insecure about his place in the narrative of like Earth's folklore, like is <laughs> I just don't know ya. Don't know ya. Pretty much the worst thing you can say to somebody whose value is derived from kind of how famous they are, how powerful they are seen by mortals. Oof. Jupiter's gonna need some ice for that burn. Number 13 is from the sorcerer. Sir, you acted with discrimination and showed more delicate appreciation than we expect in persons of your station. The reason why this burn is so savage is because Alexis truly does think that this person is less than him because he's in a different class. And although he isn't strictly intending it as a burn, I he must know on some level that it is. And it is just such a vile thing to say to somebody, oh, oh, I'm impressed because I, I thought that you'd have been a savage, but oh no, you're actually quite civilised. Oh, oh God, it's, oh, it makes me wretch. Number 12 is from the Yeoman of the Guard. We will suppose that I caught you kissing the kitchen wench under my very nose. Under her very nose, good sir, not under yours. That is where I would kiss her. Do you take me? Oh, sir, a pretty wit, a pretty, pretty wit. The maiden comes. Such a good example of a burn <laughs> by just not saying anything. I just not even responding to Jack Point's joke. It's just the maiden comes. The lieutenant is savage. He is a really savage character. Like he is one of the few people that actually are able to slightly knock Jack Point off his pedestal in believing that he is like the king of comedy. Like the lieutenant 
he is just so dignified. And he also does have a sense of humour and he knows what he likes, he knows what he finds funny. But he doesn't find that funny and I, <laughs> I love it, I love it. Number 11 is from Princess Ida. To those who know the workings of your mind, your face and figure, sir, suggest a book appropriately banned. Now, I do not like Cyril. In fact, he is one of my characters in GNS that I least want to be friends with, as we saw in last time's video. But hey, this 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 is a good line. This is like this is one of the only times when I think Gama is truly insulted by another person speaking. The only reason this didn't come higher on this list is because in the context, I guess it could come across as a bit ableist because Gama does have some physical features which people do talk about, but he himself draws attention to them. So I felt that including this one wasn't terribly problematic. <laughs> Number 10 is from Iolanthe. Go away, madam. I should say, madam, you display, madam, shocking taste. It is rude, madam, to allude, madam, to your brood, madam, brazen-faced. I know this is sung, and I think that a lot of the times that because this is sung, I think people don't realise just how brutal that is. Can you imagine just taking somebody aside and saying to them, you display shocking taste. What you just did was very like oh wow how patronizing is that oh that that is really nasty and i think even the fairy queen who is one of the most powerful and secure people in the universe i think even she can be a little bit taken aback by that because it takes then it takes the fairies chorus having to assure her that no he, what he did was rude. He was in the wrong just there. Only after that does she respond to him. So it does seem like that does take a, a bit aback. And I can see why. It is brutal. Number nine is from Patience. Has he succeeded in idealising you? He has. Good old Bunthorn. Oh, Duke. No, the Duke's like a nice character. But oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> like idealizing you as if you could ever be idealized <laughs> lady jane is gonna need to go to a and e and get a skin graft for that that is horrible number eight is from the yeoman of the guard you too eh are you man and wife no sir for though i'm a fool there is a limit to my folly I get that Point was talking about Elsie's mother here, but still, can you imagine just being Elsie listening to that? Like, that was uncalled for. What? You say it's that much of folly marrying me? Oh, you could see why she didn't really think that he felt for him until until the second act. Like, wow. Or until the end of the act one finale. Jack, what, he, he does not know how to talk to people he likes. That that is horrible. That's a really, can you imagine? What a horrible thing to say publicly about that to somebody who obviously really looks up to you. How embarrassing. Number seven is from Iolanthe. My Phyllis, today we are to be made happy forever. Well, we're to be married. <laughs> Phyllis! Strephon in that moment. I mean, he does give as good as he gets. He says some quite mean things to Phyllis as well, but that to me is the most savage thing that these two say to each other, just in terms of it not being driven by any kind of emotion particularly. It's not said out of anger. It, it's not just like a stream of insults. You know, this is like, <laughs> it's just a matter of fact thing. <laughs> it's just, whoa, you people need to take more notice of what you're saying. Number six is from Princess Ida. Why, how old you've grown. Is this Hilarion? Why, you've changed too. You are a singularly handsome child. Gama just truly goes for the jugular, doesn't he? Just the way he so he speaks so eloquently and so beautifully, but the things he is saying are just dripping with such poison. <laughs> oh, you're a handsome child. <laughs> it's like, you're ugly. <laughs> Oh, all right. All right, Gama. 
he is probably the most savage individual in the canon. Number five is from the Yeoman of the Guard. I know that he who is about to die is more to thee than I, who am alive and well. Why, that were out of reason, dear Wilfred. Do they not say that a live ass is better than a dead lion? Phoebe, you are trying to get the keys from this guy to rescue Fairfax. What are you saying? <laughs> <laughs> it's the way it just comes out of her and then she realises what he said. It's like insulting him. It's just automatic to her. And what a terrible thing to say. Oh, you know, I'd rather have you alive than him when he's dead. <laughs> wow. And it's just so eloquently said and just so off the cuff and so automatic. Like Phoebe is also a pretty savage character, but that just makes her so fabulous. Like I love these characters. Like all these characters that say these lines, oh, maybe apart from Cyril, like they're just so fabulous and I love them for their savagery. Number four is from the Grand Duke. His trusting nature. Oh, I would like to talk to you in my own language for five minutes. Only five minutes. I know some good, strong, energetic English words that would shrivel your trusting nature into raisins. Only you wouldn't understand them. I don't even need to talk about how brilliant this is. Julia is just one of the most brilliant characters that Gilbert created. And this line is my favourite line that she says. <laughs> it's just so full of venom. Interestingly, a couple of lines from the previous song actually did make it into the list, but I removed them because I felt they were just strings of insult. But, you know, for honourable mention, you stupid muff who's made of stuff not worth a pinch of snuff. <laughs> and it's all your fault, you booby you, you lump of indiscrimination <laughs> that is I, I because it's sung again you don't really linger on it but how good of an insult is that you lump of indiscrimination <laughs> like you you are a lump of indiscrimination like, it's so good gilbert was great with his words that was great number three is from hms pinafore i am the last person to insult a british sailor sir joseph you are the last person who did captain corcoran this isn't so much of like an insult as just a moment where like you really imagine you know, you know that clip of all the guys going whoa you know? <laughs> it's like you are the last person who did <laughs> it's just so quick and so clever and <laughs> wow and I, I do imagine all the sailors going like <sighs> after that because they love their captain but also, he can be quite a snob, and this must just be so gratifying for all of them in a way, and it's just such a great moment. I love it. Number two is from Princess Ida. Bravo! Your king deprives me of my head, that he and I may meet on equal terms. <laughs> this is fabulous! This is my favourite thing that Gama says, and that comes from a lot of things that he said. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but... Four of the most sickest, savage burns in GNS come from the same scene in Princess Ida. And I, I don't apologise for that. Like, that is, it's such a great scene for just savagery. It's so cruel, but also so beautiful, so clever, so funny. Oh, I absolutely love that scene for this. And maybe I should have ranked that dialogue scene a bit higher in my previous ranking videos. Number one of the sickest burns in GNS goes to... The Grand Duke. My dear, under the circumstances you are doing admirably, and you'll improve with practice. It's so difficult to be a lady when one isn't born to it. The Baroness, I think, does slightly take just the most extravagant, fabulous crown from King Gama. She has to up Julia. And as we've seen, Julia is such a massive character that that is not an easy thing to do. And all power to her. But this is just dripping with such insincereness. It's a little bit like another one that almost made it to the list, which is Julia's from the Act One finale. Oh, don't be foolish, dear. You couldn't play it, darling. It's a leading business pet and you're but a sabrette. I didn't include it on the list because it wasn't terribly snappy or concise, but it's that kind of energy. And to me, that is just the worst burn because the thing is, it's something that sounds 
so sweet, but you know it isn't and you know it isn't meant that way. And just the the level to which Julia must be just boiling with anger after she says that is just, again, so gratifying. After everything Julia has done, I'm, I am obsessed with this. Thank you so much for watching this slightly shorter video. I hope you guys are enjoying these little bite-sized chunks of GNS fun. Do come at me with your suggestions of videos you want to make. As you can see, I've already filmed the Sorcerer dialogue. I'm going to do the Pinafore dialogue and the Thespis dialogue as well. And I'm also just going to rank some of the most beautiful poetic moments in GNS. I'll be doing that too. And the 20 funniest lines in GNS, which I kind of started doing on TikTok, but it didn't seem to get any kind of traction, so I stopped. But maybe that was silly and I should continue. Let me know in the comments what you think I should do next. And I will see you next time. Subscribe to the channel, please. Thank you.